Well, Konstantin Kissin, welcome to 27 Rouge. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, man. No worries. I start off most of my interviews with this question, uh, and I think it's for good reason because people take it in different directions, and I'm interested to see where you'll take it. So, okay. who is Constantine? Who 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 am I? Yeah. Uh, you want a bio or no? Not a bio. Who are you as a person? Um, a writer, a father. A... Yeah. All well, all those things. I think um, I, I have a very boring life, to be honest with you, Scott. I work and I spend time with my family. That's really mostly what I do. Uh, I have uh, friends and increasingly being in this space means that I have really interesting friends that mm -hmm. I enjoy spending time with. But primarily um, what I do is uh, run this mm -hmm. um, and write my Substack, which is doing very well and uh, spend time with my wife and son. That's really what I do. Um, but in terms of my role, maybe in how I see what I'm trying to do is I am, a, uh, you know, I grew up in the late Soviet Union, mm -hmm. infused from the very early days, maybe too much so. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of like Russian grandmothers traumatizing me with stories from the gulags and stuff like that. But it was very much from an early age ingrained in me that we were living in a society that was extremely restrictive about what you're supposed to think. Um, and in living memory, mm -hmm. members of my own family had experienced some of the terrible consequences of what happened when they said the wrong thing or expressed an opinion or made a political comment or made a joke in the wrong place at the wrong time, etc. So from a very early age, I had this experience of understanding that freedom of expression is something that's always under attack. Right. And then when I came over to the UK, it was like, oh, wow, you know, this is a, a much freer place where people are free. But I also saw that even here in the West, there were always people who wanted to take our ability to joke and play and say things away as well. Mm. Uh, and I remember my comedy heroes growing up were people like George Carlin and Bill Hicks yeah. and all these guys <laughs> who were pushing back against what was then the Christian right in America and less so, but to some extent here, the, the sort of religious right mm. who wanted to restrict what people could say, what they could joke about. There was a sort of uh, morality police almost in, right. intellectually and uh, it shows up in all sorts of ways I mean Bill Hicks's last comedy performance on Letterman he was censored and it wasn't censored because of woke snowflakes or whatever yeah it was censored by people who didn't like the fact that he was joking about gay marriage and things like that right mm. so I grew up observing that and then I sort of really didn't pay much attention to what was happening in the political and cultural space I was busy trying to you know survive yeah. basically and then when I became a comedian and that was only about seven or eight years ago it was a bit of a career change for me I suddenly realized that my idea of what western society was what comedy was from watching people like Carlin and Hicks and others really didn't map on very well onto what was happening here because we were increasingly living in, in a in an environment where people were again very keen to restrict what you are allowed to say and what you're allowed to joke about and what opinions you're allowed to have. We, there's a kind of, um, I call it a totalitarianism of the mind. This was the yep. communist approach. Yep. And increasingly you see it here where it's like, you're supposed to have a set of opinions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you're supposed to be destroyed for it in many cases, particularly if you're a public person, because and this idea that your opinion really, really, really matters because you have 20,000 Twitter followers or whatever. Um, and so who am I on a personal level is someone who is um, really maybe hypersensitive, but I think some people like that are necessary in society to the fact that there will always be people who want to restrict what you're allowed to think and say. Mm -hmm. And I oppose that vehemently and I always will. So that's who I am. Okay, thank you. There's a there's a lot there. I want to I want to dig into a few things that you mentioned. One one is about, you know, the the person with the public profile, obviously they're under a lot of scrutiny uh and they're engaged, you know, they 
they may be expected to engage with some of these issues on you know on a daily basis especially if they're out in the, the twitter sphere or whatever mm. but i want to i want to hone in on people with less public profiles mm. just an everyday guy gets up early in the morning goes to work punches in puts in you know 8 10 12 14 mm. 16 hard hours of work goes home to his family if he has a family you know and he's just focused on surviving maybe he's an immigrant maybe he's not mm. you know what do we say to the guy who's who is perhaps bothered by some of the things he sees going on he's bothered by the censoriousness he's bothered by the thought crime stuff mm. um and he's thinking this this doesn't make much sense you know i i'm i'm supposed to think red and say blue like i'm supposed to you know think <laughs> see that the king is naked and, mm. and not comment on this uh but he's just focused on surviving mm. he doesn't need you know say he works even middle management small company or, mm. or or an office you know he doesn't want issues with hr he wants to collect his paycheck feed his wife mm. and his child Mm -hmm. she's also perhaps working and he's like you know what this is not my fight i'm not i'm not i'm not on twitter i'm not on uh, i'm not i'm not a public intellectual mm -hmm. uh i just i want to put my head down i i got to just survive mm -hmm. what do we say to this person i mean the argument can be made of course that if everyone just put their head down it leads to disastrous mm -hmm. consequences but there are a lot of people who are really maybe not thinking of maybe they're not on twitter maybe they or a lot of them aren't you know they're not on uh social media thinking mm -hmm. about this stuff every mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. uh what do we say to the guy who's just you know going to work trying to survive so i and think that if you are truly unconcerned about what's happening then carry on with your life right and do whatever you want to do uh if you are concerned about what's happening um then you have a duty to do something what that is depends on everybody's situation i can't sit here and say you know single mother of two you need to sort of get fired in your job for saying the whatever i'm uh, sorry where does that duty come from where that duty where does that duty come from well if you feel that something that is happening in your society is wrong fundamentally morally wrong mm. right people are being persecuted for having opinions right people are being prevented from speaking their mind this is it's not just wrong on a moral level although it is it's also fundamentally antithetical to the very idea of the western project right western civilization is built on certain principles and and the idea of freedom of expression is one of them so the duty you have is if you value what we have in the west you have to contribute to upholding that society otherwise other people who feel they have a duty to protect you from other people's opinions and protect you from your own opinions and protect right. you from being exposed to the wrong information they will achieve their aim which is creating a society in which you can't say what you think mm. so uh, that's where the duty comes from from a moral point of view you're observing something being done that is wrong and uh we've seen over and over and over in history what happens when the vast majority of people know something's wrong and stay silent about yeah. it and i come from one of those societies um but when i say a duty to do something i don't mean that your duty is to sacrifice yourself on the altar of free speech and and whatever you could just simply support people who do it for you right, right. you could uh, and i know this sounds like a self-serving point however you know we have a lot of people a valid one though. a valid i hope it is who watch our show who support trigonometry and they say you know i can't say what i think at work but you guys are doing it on my behalf yeah here is 5 pounds a month and that's something that is open to you but more broadly i i feel that you know from my perspective you know yes not everyone is going to have a podcast but when we started trigonometry it wasn't from a place of hey you know we're going to make loads of money and be super successful that's why we're doing it we were fed up with what was happening and the desire to do what we do didn't start from a place of comfort it was like we think what's happening in the world is wrong what's happening in our own industry is wrong we're going to do something about it and actually most people think that you know the name of our show is a like f u to the to the woke snowflakes terms that we never use it's not at all it was actually us saying 
to the comedy industry, which is where Francis and I came from, like, we're going to talk about some controversial issues. You might be offended. Yeah. We were aware that we were likely to be punished for doing what we did. And we were. Uh, but sometimes you have to take the punishment because you believe in doing something that's important. And long term, you may well be rewarded for it. I think sometimes you do have to take the punishment, of course. The, where where I, I, I pause and, and, and reflect a bit is, is, this, is this gradient, you know, the, the gradient of what, of what that punishment could be. Mm. If you're living in the Soviet Union, your punishment could be getting sent to a gulag or just, you mm -hmm. know, just, you're just killed one day mm -hmm. you know you, you just you mm. know you're going to work and then you never come home yeah. what happened to you you don't know yeah. like your family there's no trace there's a difference you know there's a not to be trite but there's a line from a, a wonderful ridley scott film called the counselor where he says one of the characters says there's a difference between leaving a body out in the street for people to see and putting it in the desert where no one's ever going to see it those are same outcome as if the person dies, but the, there's a difference. Same thing. There's a difference. If you want to just slip poison in someone's, you know, soup at lunch and then they just die, that's one way of killing someone. Another way is beheading them in the street mm. or subjecting them to some kind of long, humiliating, mm. tar and feathering public ritual. So getting your 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 uh, knuckles uh, hit with with a ruler by HR because you you know won't put pronouns in your LinkedIn mm. bio is one thing. Uh, losing your job and not being able to provide for your family is a, a, a big step up from that. Mm. And then just you know disappearing somewhere. You're in you're you're in a place you're not in a liberal Western mm -hmm. democracy, and you just disappear. And either people know that you've disappeared, you've been made an example out of, or you just never come home. You know who, who knows what happened to mm. you? Maybe you're in a, a labor camp somewhere. Or maybe you're dead. Mm. So there are people I think who would want to speak up, but mm -hmm. are really fearful of the consequences. I don't know, like, I, I, don't, I don't have a specific point here. But well, no, you have a specific point, and your point is that sometimes the punishment is really bad and is it worth it, and should everyone be encouraged to go down that path? Well, it depends, and, I suppose. I don't well, know. this is the point, it depends. However, if you come back to your point about the Soviet Union, there were many people in the Soviet Union who who were poets or who were authors or writers or um, artists of some kind mm. who did go to the gulags and who were killed. And they did it anyway, and many of them did it knowing that that's what would happen. And they felt that there is something in life that's more important than having a job. And we all feel that there's something in life that's more important than having a job. For example, I don't know that you would let, if your boss said to you, you know what, I need to have sex with your teenage daughter for you to keep this job, you'd probably say no, right? So we all have a line somewhere about what we are and aren't prepared to accept in order to have a job. We all draw a line somewhere. And yeah. where that line is for you personally really depends on what your moral values are and how strongly you feel about certain things, etc. For me, um, saying that the direction of travel that we are going in, and it's not just freedom of expression, it, there's also something that bothers me just as much, which is a kind of re-racialization of society. Mm. Um, bothers me too. <laughs> it, should, it should, it should bother everyone in my opinion. Um, when I saw that happening, in, particularly in the industry that I was working in, I felt that saying something about that was more important than being liked and supported by people in that industry. Mm. And in the industry that I was operating in at the time, I am now a complete pariah. I couldn't go back to the comedy circuit and work on the comedy circuit. It couldn't happen. I, not that I need to, right? But I was prepared to take that risk and say that at the time because I felt it was important to me. There are other people for whom uh, they have a different temperament. And, you know, it's an interesting question. People sometimes will ask you, like, I don't know if you've been asked this question, but do you do you wish everyone in society was like you? <laughs> and for me, the answer to that isn't is isn't yes. It's no. I don't wish everyone was, but you do need some contrarian assholes like me 
who are going to be like, excuse me, sorry, what, what about, <laughs> you know, the kid at the back of the class? You need some of them. And in order for those people to be effective in what they do, they need to feel the backing of the rest of the class in raising the issue, mm. right? So I don't think every single person needs to sacrifice self-immolate in order to make a point. But what you can do is channel your energies or your money or your support or, or whatever uh, in, in, in encouraging people who are challenging this stuff uh, if you don't want to be one of them. Yeah. But, and I think there's, there's a middle ground to be found with all of these things. However, what I will say is this. If you feel very strongly that things are happening uh, that are wrong, I don't think you're going to be able to keep that down. I've never met anyone who's talked to me about, uh, you know what, I feel really strongly about this issue, but, you know, these are the consequences. I'm worried. I haven't met a single person who's been able to make peace with that who's been able to make peace with the fact that they truly feel that something's happening in society that is wrong and they're not doing anything about it. I've never met a single person who is comfortable with that dichotomy going on inside of them. Well, they may not be comfortable with it, but there are plenty of people who object privately to what's going on and publicly march along. And I think that's a very unhappy place to be, is what I'm saying. It is. Yeah. So, so what I would encourage those people to do is, a, is find a way to channel their sense of moral indignation or whatever it is that they feel into constructive action. It doesn't have to be their action. You can, as I say, support people. You know, you can become a member of the free speech union in this country. Mm. You can give money to a podcast that you think is doing the right yep. thing. You can support a writer on Substack. You can, whatever it might look like. You, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to politics, don't ever vote for people who don't share that view of that particular issue. Yep. Or vote for people who share your view of it, etc. So I think there are many different ways, but do channel your feelings into action. Otherwise, you're stuck in this place of, uh, I think, uh, you know, when you're violating your own moral codes, when you, you see things happening that are wrong and you're doing nothing about it, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's a good place to be. No, it's not. It's a massive pebble in your shoe. Yeah. So a few, thing comes, a few things come to mind. First of all, Free Speech Union. I totally forgot that Toby lived in London. Toby Young. Toby Young, yeah. He had he had my the job I had at Quillette before I had it. Yeah. And I should have reached out to him, but I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh so no. Blimey. Next time. Next time. Next time. Toby's a great guy. And he's uh, done very important work with the free speech with the free speech union. There uh, we've had a few situations recently in particular where I've been able to call him up and go, look, this thing's going on. Can you you know, and there are a lot of people in positions um, who don't have a, even a big audience or anything yep. like that, who've been able to get support and encouragement and help and legal advice, et cetera. So they're doing really important work and I would really encourage people to support them for sure. The other, I also encourage people to support them. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with their work, but I'm familiar enough with the people who I respect that support it. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, it, it, it seems like a good cause. Um, two other things come to mind, a little, a little fun, and then we'll, we'll get into another spicy, serious question. Mm -hmm. One is you said there's always going to be a contrarian, like asshole, like me in the, you know, in the back, who's going to mm -hmm. raise his hand. I just think of, uh, in the big short, the movie with who's the actor from the American version of the office, uh, Steve, Steve Carell. Mm -hmm. Um, he, they, this guy's giving a presentation. He goes, Excuse me, excuse me. I have a question, please. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so that sprung to mind, and that's mm. funny. Um, and two, I I don't know to whom I can attribute this. It's it's trotted out on social media often. Um, and I, but it's a good thing, you know. It's it's a little sprinkle of kale juice in a in a, in a world of of McDonald's. Um, it's if you're in a room where you think everyone agrees with you. Uh, if you're in a room where you you hold an opinion that is contrary to the consensus, if you raise your hand and you just say, hey guys, you know, I I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I don't, I don't really fully agree with this. Uh, I guarantee there'll be someone else in the audience who also sticks up their hand and you'll find that you're not as alone as you thought you mm -hmm. were. There's this Abilene paradox. Are you familiar with the Abilene paradox? I am actually. Is uh, so 
I, I don't know if it's the thing. I uh, I somebody sent me something. I think it's the Abilene paradox, where whereby essentially in large institutions and companies, is that what we're talking about? Uh, I'm not? sure it's a, a, a corollary. That's not not specifically what I'm talking about. Okay, well, tell me about the Abilene paradox then. The Abilene paradox simply there's a family in Abilene, Texas, okay. where each individual member of the family is told that all the other members of the family want to go to the theme park. And they're each, you know, they separate the five members of the family. They're all told each of the other four wants to go to the theme park. And then the family together gets in the car and goes to the theme park when none of the individuals actually want to go, but they just think that the others do. Right, right. So this is, uh, I think it may be exactly the same thing that we're talking about, but applied to institutions. Sure. Uh, somebody sent it to me. I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically the idea that in a large institution, quite often capture or a certain directionality occurs mm -hmm. because most people don't want to say something, right? So if everyone thinks that everyone else thinks something and no one says anything to challenge that particular worldview, yeah. then everyone ends up moving in a direction simply thinking that the rest of the family or the corporation or the institution is intended on going in that direction when the vast majority of the people involved were never asked and actually probably wouldn't want to move in that direction. And that, I think, explains a lot of where we are more broadly as a society. I think that's called pluralistic ignorance. I remember reading that about something quite similar to that mm. in uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is taken from, from Lincoln's second inaugural and then, and then made into Stephen Pinker used as the title mm. um, of the book. Uh, but he writes about pluralistic ignorance wherein a society can, on a small or large scale, can end up collectively adopting beliefs that none of, to which none of the individual members of that society adhere, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite similar to what you've just described. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Here's 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 a fun one. I'm I'm excited to ask this question, and I might I might stumble through the phrasing here because uh, I'm I'm working through this myself. This is not necessarily a position that I hold. So for the cameras, I'm gonna just put out that qualifier. But I have some strong suspicions that this might be the case. It seems that there is a massive psychological operation unfolding, particularly within the West, within the Anglosphere, wherein some of these issues that we have begun to lacerate ourselves over and really self-flagellate over are are quite they're 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 kind of silly to be honest um and my you know race all of the discourse around race all of the discourse around gender particularly around gender is what really made me begin to, to scratch my head mm. um my contention or perhaps not contention what i suspect is that this is a psychological operation designed to sow discord within the West. Where it's coming from, I'm not sure. Perhaps Russia, perhaps China, probably not so much Iran, but perhaps perhaps some combination of, of, of the three they're in or other, other actors. But I think that the discord in the West, the, the, the denouncing ourselves over issues related to race, issues related to gender, issues related to the, the value of liberal Western democracy, issues really, you know, all this discourse about slavery. It seems that we have begun to criticize ourselves in our institution in the West. We've begun to criticize ourselves and our institutions uh, in such a way that it delegitimizes any criticism we want to give towards totalitarian governments and human rights abuses abroad. So how are we to tell China not to round up and kill Uyghurs when we ourselves are apparently an incredibly racist, incredibly sexist, incredibly unfair, unequal society founded on, uh, founded on, on on abhorrent principles and abhorrent institutions like slavery. Mm. Uh, it seems 
And I mean, our enemies are our enemies. Our our geopolitical rivals are emboldened by this, saying, "Who are you to tell us what to do?" When your own citizens are complaining about how racist and how unfair and how unequal and how there's no meritocracy, where you know, take care of your own garden before coming into our garden and telling us how to run our society that has a different ethnic makeup and you know our stuff. And I, I think this is a bullshit argument, of course. I, I don't think that a lot of these issues have merit, but or that they don't have merit in the way that people think they have merit. Um, and I, I think that it began as something strategic, right? As a way to strategically sow discord in the West so as to le- delegitimize any criticism that we would level against you know, related to human rights, related to ever in other countries. But my, here's here's the the, the head scratching part, Constantine. It that it, it's it's I think it started as something strategic, and now I sort of have a picture of guys sitting around, you know, drinking probably not pints, but drinking, you know, whatever they're drinking, and just laughing their asses off watching you know people fight over having 20 different pronouns having you know biological men competing in women's sports and watching people you know red in the face like screaming at each other watching the US kind of crack up a little bit having all this hatred um you have a lot of it in in the United Kingdom as well though i think it's a, it, it's a different strand it's a different flavor of the same uh the same milkshake um, but I think like some of uh, the, the, who is the bearded, um, Twitter guy from, from, he's one of Ben's guys, uh, Matt Walsh, hmm. um, the, the, who is a woman that, that was funny, you know, going around to like, what do you mean? I don't understand the question. Um, I, it seems like it started as something strategic, the sewing discord. And now it's just like, they're laughing. They're like these fucking idiots. This is what they're talking. This is what they're arguing about in America. Like this is, you know. The, 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 as far as cultural mercantilism goes, the, the cultural capital of the world, whatever. Like, this is what they're, and I just, I envision a group of guys in a room. And again, I'm not to be too conspirational. I don't think it's necessarily one small group meeting that they have on April 16th every year where they're, you know, drinking schnapps and saying, how, how far can we, you know, like, look at how far we push this. But I see, like, the new issues that pop up that especially the the quote unquote youth of which I'm a part by mm. virtue of my birth here um, are arguing about are really silly and that they they got to this state of how how far can we push this like surely people aren't gonna go like this is this is too far people mm. aren't gonna people aren't gonna buy into this mm. how far can we push it and then people did buy into it and you know, Twitter and social media is an instrument by which they enacted this. But I don't, I don't know. What do you, what do you make of all this? Like the strategic discord thing, and then also the, the nefarious comedy thing of how far can we push this? Uh, interesting. Are you familiar with a guy called Yuri Bezmenov? I am not. Uh, you're gonna enjoy his videos on uh, on YouTube. This is he was a, a KGB defector who uh, fled the Soviet Union. I think in the late seventies. Uh, via India, went to Canada and eventually started giving lectures about uh, de- what he called demoralization. And mm. his, um, his, I was going to say thesis, but his assertion was that the Soviet Union was spending almost all of its intelligence budget not on, you know, getting microfilms of American bridges or nuclear facilities or whatever, but it was rather spending uh, almost all of its money on destabilizing the core fundamental values and institutions of uh, American society. Um, and he was through, th- through covert means, th- through, and well, sowing discord from within. Through influencing the media, through in- influencing labor relations, through influencing uh, education, uh, particularly. Um, and his his essential idea was that you know what you do is you encourage useful idiots in the West who think communism is great or whatever to uh, 
become more vocal voices in the society and undermine the existing values of that society. Now, do I believe that all of this comes from foreign interference? I don't. And actually, even Besmanov himself sort of said that you can't de demoralize a society that is unwilling to, to become demoralized itself. And I think the truth of this is that for whatever uh, West, you know, whatever the enemies of the West, and I think you're right to use that word, you, you, you said it and then you laughed. And this is what we do now in the West. We, 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 we've forgotten that enemies exist. We've forgotten that, uh, you know, people in Russia and people in China absolutely see the West as an enemy. Uh, but we've become uncomfortable in recognizing that reality. Um, well, I have friends in these countries, it's not the citizens, it's the governments. It's the governments, but increasingly they will get their citizens to see things that way too. Uh, people in Russia, increasingly, uh, not all people, of course, there are, every society has different groups within it. People in Russia increasingly do see the West as the enemy. Uh, and that's because they're being told it's the enemy over yeah. and over and over again. Um, but anyway, uh, my, it's not just that our enemies are doing this. I think it's, it's worse than that, actually. Uh, we are doing this to ourselves. Now, why that's happening is a long... That's, that's the question. Well, I mean, part of it, you have to recognize that every great civilization ends at some point. Right? Yep. And so I think the question we have to... We're wrestling with all of us is, is Western civilization getting a bit tired of being on top? Because when you spend a lot of time being the top dog in the world, eventually you get a new generation of people, younger people who don't understand sure. how that was achieved. They don't understand why that's the case. And so they start to ask questions. They go, well, well why do I have lots and people over there don't? Why do uh, I have safety? Well, until recently anyway, and people over there don't. Why, why do I have stability and people over there? Why is that? Isn't that unfair? Isn't that unreasonable? And look, oh, we, we, we had slavery. Wow, that's really bad. Uh, you know, and we shouldn't have slavery, should we? And we're going, well, no, we shouldn't. So, so why did, and if you have university professors who teach kids about slavery without teaching them about slavery, they just teach them this tiny aspect yeah, of slavery about yeah, their yeah. own country, you very quickly get to a position where you have a whole generation of people who don't necessarily hate their own country, but they don't understand why it's where it is, why it's valuable, why the values that underpin it are important. And so you get to a position where I think people think that, you know, I think a lot of people of your generation think that if we just, if we take away all the things that made Western civilization great, Western civilization will still be great. Mm. That's not how it works. Uh, so I think this is a, a fundamental challenge to our view of ourselves that comes from within. We are, I think, victims of our own success. Other people, other influencers will try and amplify that, and the Chinese and the Russians are definitely doing that. But fundamentally, this is a disease of our own making. Um, and that's why the antidote has to come from within as well. It has to be about a reinvigoration of the values that made our civilization what it is. If we don't have that, we will collapse like every great civilization in history. There's an argument to be made that no matter how hard we, it's a bit of a nihilist argument, but a nihilistic argument, but there's an argument to be made. There's this guy, I think he's at Harvard, Peter, Peter Turchin. Um, he wrote a book about this. Uh, Barry had him on her podcast. I don't know when I, whenever she did. Um, his research is interesting. He, he's, he looks at the, the lifespan of civilizations and his, Thesis, I mean, among other things, is that the S, the West, is entering what he calls end times. Mm. So, you know, we've all read, well, we haven't all read, but there's, I haven't even read all of it, but uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, you know, by Gibbons, the, the, the great chronicle of, of how mm. Rome fell. Um, there's an argument to be made that even if we try really hard, this is the fate of any great civilization there's that um i think it's william golding poem uh nothing gold can stay uh so dawn goes down today nothing gold can stay uh it can't last forever i would like to live in this society for 
the entirety of my life and the entirety of my children's lives and the entirety of their children's lives. You, you're a father. You want your, your child to, to grow up in a flourishing, prosperous, uh, beautiful society. I, I want, I, I want this mm-hmm. to be clear. Mm-hmm. I want this to endure, mm-hmm. to continue. My, my question, and, and you were alluding to it earlier, is whether it can. And it sounds like you think if we have this reinvigoration and we understand why why the American experiment, for example, this this pinnacle of the Enlightenment that mm. was created, uh, has endured for a few hundred years and what has allowed it to endure. And we appreciate the, the virtues of liberalism and Western democracy. Uh, and we teach our children to appreciate it, to appreciate all of these wonderful things they have rather than to hate themselves for it and hate their country for it. Perhaps it can endure uh, a bit longer. I don't know what a bit means. I don't know if that means 50, 100, 1,000 years. Mm. Um, I mean, there are not many civilizations that endured for 1,000 years. No, there's not. So at some point, yes. Uh, But my argument is very simply this. Uh, None of us can predict the future. What I can predict is that if we carry on down the path that we're on, our end is coming much quicker than it might otherwise come. And so, again, we come back to that word duty that I used earlier. It is therefore the duty of all of us who understand that to speak up for the values that we think made the West great and will allow it to endure longer. It might not be a bit longer. It could be a lot longer. My suspicion is that most people uh, most people are swimming in the soup that our media and education system creates. They're not necessarily fully present to what's happening, and it will take something really serious to shake them out of that stupor. Uh, the problem is what is some, what is something really serious? Oh, God knows. Uh, I I, I a don't, war, for example. Well, right, and I think for a lot of people, uh, Ukraine war. The war in Ukraine example. was a wake up call for yeah. a lot of people. Definitely, definitely. Um, but the war in Ukraine is something that can still be compartmentalized. It's not something that affects your daily life, etc. Et uh, I think we're probably going to have more wake up call opportunities over the next several decades. And how we respond to those is what's gonna determine the future, I think. Um, And that's really where you're gonna find out, you know, are we still a civilization that's willing to to stand up for itself uh, and to fight for itself or not? And if I think about, ultimately, the test of a society or a civilization is whether it's willing to fight for itself. Mm. I wonder- That's a- a I wonder if you were to poll your generation and mine, how many people would be like, you know what, there's a war going on over there uh, that's about the fate of Western civilization. Let's send the American boys to storm the beaches. How many people would be in favor of that today? I wonder. Um, So we're in a dangerous place, I think. Um, You can see that the, the Russians, for example, not that the ordinary Russian person is desperate to end up on, on in Ukraine, but They'll go and fight. They're happy to. Right. Happy is overstating it. Willing. The willing. Um, or unwilling to go to prison, not to, or whatever, right? Um, and I, Yeah, in a way that people in the West probably would not be. Well, we don't know is the truth, right? I mean, one of the things that COVID showed us is there are a lot of things about our fellow citizens that we do not know. Uh, I thought that we lived in a society where we really valued freedom a lot. And... Um, we understood the trade-offs that freedom has. And one of the trade-offs of freedom is a lack of safety. Mm. People forgot. I mean, we've become a society of trade-off denialists, really. We deny the idea that certain things that we want also cost something. (laughs) We do. (laughs) That's that's an excellent phrasing. So with COVID, what we found out is that actually there's an inner authoritarian in quite a lot of people that will come out when people are scared. Uh, And so we don't know what people might be willing to do if they're really scared. And some of those things that they might be willing to do might be heroic and courageous and, and, and really important. But 
right now, I am asking the question, are we willing to, uh, to, to actually uh, risk things? This is, this is the fundamental thing about all of this. And it's actually our conversation started with this. You were asking me, what should the ordinary person do? And you are coming at it from a position, well, there's a lot to lose. And when you stand up for things that are important, there's always a lot to lose. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called standing up, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the place we're in, and that's what I think we ought to be concerned with. And so teaching young people about the value, and the easiest way to teach it isn't to tell them, it's to show them. This is why I think it's really important for people to travel. Because when you go to places that don't have all the things that we enjoy, suddenly it opens your eyes to quite a lot about your own society. Absolutely does. So uh, in many ways, understanding how great the first world is, is a product of exposure to the rest of the world. You know, it's the Siddhartha narrative. You go outside the walls of the palace and see the real world. Um, a, a few things here. I, I remember talking with uh, Heather McDonald, mm. um, Firebrand, uh, and we were talking about lockdowns, I think. I was in Australia at the time. Mm. And Heather goes, the effeminization of the Australian government is something I can't wrap my head around, mm. or I forget the, the, the exact quote. Um, and at the time, I was taken aback. I was like, Heather? <laughs> um, but she's, she's, I don't know, you know, masculine, feminine, whatever. We don't need to get into all this. is a conversation oh, that I don't care to have right now. Oh, but we should. We can, well, we, we, we can, we can, we'll dip, we can dip our toes in. Um, but the, the point here I'm, I'm interested in is just the, I'm, I'm honestly, Constantine, I'm ashamed, uh, I'm truly ashamed that I didn't speak out against some of the authoritarian creep that I saw uh, in our response to COVID. Mm. Um, I try to employ, I think we call it, uh, I think it's called Hanlon's razor. Don't attribute Hanlon's law. Uh, don't attribute to malice what could be reasonably explained by incompetence. I try to hold that in my mind just as a general framework mm. for thinking about the world. Mm. <laughs> at the same time i saw people just roll over and willfully surrender their freedoms it was so bad in australia actually that when they began opening up people were protesting uh, a little bit and saying no we want to stay locked down and the australian example is 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 unique and needs to be put in context because Australia has never really had a revolution. They've never had to fight for their rights. They call it the lucky country. There's this book that came out in the 60s, The Lucky Country of Australia has lots of natural resources. It's surrounded by ocean, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of reasons for them to not, to, to trust their government. There's less reasons in Australia for them to be distrustful mm. of government and of authority than perhaps there is in the United States or the United Kingdom. I understand that. And I think that's an important point to you, like, Australia is not the United States and Australia is not the United Kingdom with that that has to be recognized. That being said, whether you go to, you know, use the Australian example where there was some really nefarious activities going on in Australia. I was there. Mm. Um like really head scratching stuff that if you had told us 5 years ago that we'd be experiencing that, people again would have just said no way, man. Come on. Like you're, you're drunk, go home. Um, so I'm ashamed that I didn't speak out against that. I, you know, I was in uni, I was finishing school. I was finishing my first book, blah, blah, blah. Lots of excuses. I was busy with my life. Um, I was working, you know, at Quillette full time. I had, I had things going on. Um, but looking back on this, mm. two, two things become clear. One, I'm ashamed that I didn't speak out against this. And I'm happy to go on the record and say that Two. The, the extent and the numbers in which good, decent, ordinary people rolled over and said, here's my freedoms, take them. You can have, I won't put up a fight, just to take it, it's fine. Um, in all of the Anglosphere uh, and in many other parts of the world, 
was uh, it is uh, retrospectively shocking. And you know the another funny thing, people, our historical memory is so short. I don't, we don't really talk so much about COVID anymore. You're out at the pub. You're you know playing playing uh, footy with some mates. Whatever you're doing, um, we, we don't remember what you you, you finished uni like your uni was like you were like off campus the whole. What do you mean like you worked from home for like two years, three years? Like remember when Zoom wasn't a thing? People like didn't I didn't use Zoom. Hmm. I was using like Skype. And like you know in 2019 I was like, I like Skype <laughs> someone. Who, who the fuck uses Skype now? Hmm. There was this transformative thing that happened. So shame on the record and two, real astonishment in this is, I'm saying this because of something you've said that I was surprised, I am surprised and it sounds like you're surprised too at, at people's, we think that people, people say, yes, of course I support freedom, I like my freedom. And yet when push came to shove, uh, they did not stand up. They rolled over and they allowed themselves to get fucked. Does that expression lay back and think of it? It's a rather vulgar expression, but lay back and think of England. A lot of us laid back, thought of England, and I actually don't know, think a lot of people did. I think some people did, um, but I think a lot of people went much further than that. They wanted the government to come in and take care of the problem makers because, and you know, as someone who's part Jewish, I can tell you- I'm full Jewish. You're full <laughs> Jewish, right? So we both know that in history, generally speaking, when shit goes bad, people are always looking for someone to blame, yeah. right? And so I, I used to joke during the course of the pandemic, this is like the first time there's been a pandemic that they haven't blamed on the Jews. So at least that's a relief. <laughs> but, but the, you know, the unvaccinated became the Jews. Or the people who refused to wear a mask because they looked at the scientific evidence. They became the Jews or whatever. Do you see what I mean? So pe when things go bad and people are scared and there's a panic and no one knows what's going on and there's a lot of fear around. Uh, and you've got to remember there was a lot of fear around. Mm. Right? The prime minister of this country is carted off to any, everyone's staying at home, washing their hands 57 times a day, clapping for the NHS. <laughs> a lot of people in that moment go, who can we blame this on? And how do we just get things, you know, get things stable, you know, stable. Is, we want things stable. We want things uh. safe. And I understand, you know, if I was in my 90s and I was overweight and, and I had a lot of concerns about this disease being really bad. And by the way, I've had COVID three times. The two times Me too. <laughs> that I had it that were not, that were bad, it was really bad. It's, it's not a trivial disease at all. It's not something you want to have a bunch of times. And it's something that um, was definitely worth taking seriously. Absolutely. But when you take something seriously, that means that you carefully consider the trade-offs of the actions that you pursue in order to mitigate that thing. You know, I do take seriously my son's safety from falling. It doesn't mean I make him wear a helmet at home, right? There is a risk to reward ratio with all sorts of different things mm. that we do. And what happened during COVID, come back to the trade-off denial at point, we just went, you know, save lives. And we didn't think about, well, okay, we might save some lives now. How many lives are we going to not save or curtail or end with the policies that we're taking? Curtail, I think, a lot. Right. And uh, in addition to that, I think the other thing that we've become unwilling to say is there is absolutely no question if you look at the facts and the reality, that freedom has a cost, including in safety and including in lives. Mm -hmm. Because we allow people to drive cars, tens of thousands of people are killed and maimed every year. The freedom to move around in a motor vehicle that moves at fast speeds has a human cost. Yeah. yeah. We do not ban the invention of cars or, or whatever, we have certain rules around to try and manage that, but there is, no one wants to say this, there is an acceptable number of deaths a year from car accidents yeah. that we are prepared to tolerate. And that way of looking at things is very unpleasant for all of us. And it was not applied to COVID at all. And I kept saying, that I had only one question that I ever wanted anyone to address in the, in, when it came to lockdowns during the pandemic. And every week or every day, 
at certain points, we had uh, press conferences with the prime minister in which all the journalists kept asking the same question. Why aren't you locking down harder? Why aren't you going faster, deeper, hard? You know, yeah, yeah. a guest of ours called it's it like the a porn- Nike commercial, faster, deeper, harder. Yeah, harder. well, it's like the pornification of, 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 of healthcare policy. <laughs> the question I always said to them is, why does no one journalist, and I have never heard a journalist ask any, any politician this question during the pandemic or even after, how many people do lockdowns kill? How many people have you estimated your policies will kill? Because you cannot make the decision to lock down until you have that figure. Because you have to weigh both things and say, well, look, we could save, we estimate we might save 50,000 people now. Yeah. And this will kill 1,000 people. In the situation where it's life and death, that's a pretty good deal. So we'll lock down. Or you might estimate, and we're increasingly starting to see this, that there's going to be a lot of missed cancer diagnosis. There's going to be lots of lots of things that happen as a consequence of the approach we took. Sure. That have an impact on people down the line. That approach was never, never done because people lost the plot. People got scared and they demanded authoritarianism from the government. So I don't know how many people lay back and th- thought of England, I think quite a lot of people went, oh, oh, there's a danger, shut it down. No, no, I want, no, 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 I want, I want the, the those that's people. An, that's an important, that's an important distinction because laying it back and thinking of England means that you know it's bad, but you go f- with it anyway. A I, lot of people to wanted To be clear, it. yeah. And the, a lot of people, that's, Scott, and we should say this too, they loved it. A lot of people enjoyed it. They enjoyed, yeah. A, you know, a break from their lives. They were paid by the government to stay at home. Yeah, I enjoyed the break from my life. I enjoyed it. Uh, for me, lockdowns were great. Literally, they were brilliant. They were great for our show. They were great for me personally. You know, my son probably wouldn't have been born because I was working so hard. My wife and I were barely seeing each other, you know, and the lockdowns gave us an opportunity to reconnect. We spent hours, you know, at home together. We went for walks. We did all this stuff that we never had time to do before. Lockdown was great for me. And the government paid you to stay at home. You can understand why people would have enjoyed it. But you also have to think about people other than yourself when you're thinking about these things. And I could see that this was great for people like me, the sort of laptop classes. This was not good for a hell of a lot of people who were not in the same position. And um, that's why I spoke out against it. Mm. Mm. You know, but I think we shouldn't underestimate how many people love telling other people what to do. Love hundred percent. They loved it. They loved it. They did. They so did. so let's not forget about them as well. They should be ashamed. I I think a lot of uh, the what's called progress. I don't think it's, it's I think it's regressive, but a lot of you know progressive uh, talk today, progressive chatter today. Um, is really just about getting off on telling other people what to do. Mm. It feels good. Oh, I mean, it feels great. And it's the same It's the same uh, thing we see throughout history over and over again. You know, you have conditions are bad. There's wealth inequality. We don't want to take this anymore. Tensions build. Maybe there's crop failure in the case of the French Revolution. We have a revolution. The oppressed slowly becomes the oppressors. This is a great quote mm. um, uh, from The Dark Knight. I'll quote The Dark Knight. Uh, love Batman. Adore Batman. Um, in fact, if I ever move to Melbourne, there's a street called Batman Street where that's the only street I'll live on in Melbourne. Maybe if I find a cheaper apartment, I'll live somewhere else. But <laughs> Batman Street. Anyway, there's that quote, you either die here or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Mm. And I'm not interested in going into, you know, talking about getting into the philosophy of this too too heavily, but the, an oppressed group, and perhaps they are, there's legitimate uh, concerns about oppression, rises up and and, and, and throws off the, the, the chains of the oppressors. And then they themselves become the very oppressors which they once claimed to oppose. It's the animal farm story. Mm. You know, the, the last the last lines of animal farm, you look from man to pig and pig to man and mm. couldn't tell the difference. Um, I think there is something deeply appealing about telling other people what to do. No, it's power. 
And pe when people crave power, especially people who I don't think it's good, by the way, but I think it's it's it it's, is it's a human it is what it is tendency. There is no getting away from it. People will always crave that. And especially people um uh, you know, the more power you actually have, I mean, there are some psychopathic people who just want more power for the sake of it. I have found that the more influence they're I have- They're not psychopathic, they're they're human. There's evolutionary reasons well, for Well, you know. not quite, because um, the, the more, the, the thing that you become aware of as you have, you know, we run a, a small business with employees, right? I, the more power, quote unquote, I'm using inverted commas you have, the more responsibility you feel. Yeah. If you are not psychopathic. And you realize that the impact of your actions on other people is significant. And therefore, you try to wield that power with great care. And you try to consider the interests of different people. Well, if we do this, yes, it might be good for me, but is it going to be good for other people? Um, but if your life is one in which you experience very little power, if you are, quote unquote, oppressed, or you see yourself as oppressed, what that means is you don't experience yourself as having a lot of power in the world. And to those people in particular, the idea that, oh, here's a good reason for me to be able to take back the power from the oppressors, very appealing, very, very appealing. And so, um, you know, this you said progressive. It's funny, uh, um, I was having a coffee with uh, Morris Glassman, who is a labor peer, uh, and he's he, he's he's on the left, but he's not progressive. I said, you know, I said that term progressive. It's very interesting because if you go to the doctor and he says it's progressive, it's not a good thing. You know, <laughs> a lot of the the people who find this way of looking appealing, and this was the case in the Soviet Union. The people who were in favor of you know sending the kulaks, rich peasants, yeah. off to the gulags, yeah, were the people who were not able to be rich peasants because they were shit peasants right right but they would have wanted to you know be the but they wanted to be wealthy yeah, yeah. and they saw people who become wealthy of course, as a product of, of their hard work and creativity yeah, yeah, and whatever yeah, yeah. as oppressors as taking advantage why am i poor and this person is wealthy so this politics of envy this jealousy thing that's where a lot of this stuff comes from and this is why i worry about telling people they're oppressed because a it locks them into a, a victim mindset, which is not helpful to becoming unoppressed, even if you are oppressed. I don't think the people selling the victim mindset are actually interested in liberating no. the people. Oh, no, no, selling. no. <laughs> well, of course not. They're interested in converting more people to the cause of thinking of themselves as victims. Um, and so my, all I'm saying is I think the idea of telling other people what to do, of having control, yep. of installing a, a, a set of things that other people are supposed to do is particularly appealing. And I say this f knowing fully that it, it, it will trigger a lot of people. It's appealing to losers. Trigger. It's in yeah. the name. It's appealing to losers. People who are confident and comfortable in their place in life, who feel like they, they're in charge of their own life emotionally and psychologically. And they you know, yeah. if they have a problem, they're going to go and take care of it. Those people don't have time to go around telling other people what to think because they don't want to be told what to think themselves because they know that the best person to, to choose the direction of your life is you. Mm. And so this ideology appeals to losers. That's why my view is the more we encourage people to take charge of themselves and then their own lives and not be losers, that's really how you defeat an ideology like that. I would tend to agree. Mm. <laughs> I would tend to agree. It makes me think there's this old joke. Um, how do you... Uh, how do you make, uh, what is the joke? It's how do you make a, conser a conservative out of a liberal? Uh, you tell him not to change his beliefs and to just wait 20 years mm. on the question of progressive or not. But this, this raises another question that I'm, I'm particularly interested in asking you. There has come to, I wouldn't say prominence. It's still, uh, it's still certainly on the margins. I mean, just by by virtue of, of what it is. But there, there's quite a few. Um, again, a bit of a fringe minority. But there's quite a few of these post liberals out there. This this post liberal crowd of conservatives who say we tried liberalism, it failed. 
Liberalism is to blame for the gender nonsense, for the race nonsense. Now we should have kings and benevolent dictators who are capable of leading people to a virtuous, beautiful life that they would not be able to achieve without kings and benevolent dictators or some kind of authoritarian medley mm. of policies. This I'm not. I don't mean to disparage the these people, and and this is this is not. We're having a, an hour long podcast, and this is like a what a, a, a thirty second rendition. So not to disparage, not fully their position, but I worry about some of these some of the natcons. Um, I worry the national conservatives. I worry about Curtis Yarvin. Mm -hmm. I worry again minorities, right? But. And it's not all the NatCon. Some of them are very good, smart people. They're all they're all smart people, okay? And they're getting together and discussing ideas, and that's a good thing. But there's a post-liberal crowd who mm -hmm. says, we tried liberalism. It failed. Time to move on to the next thing. Fukuyama was wrong. Huntington was right. Uh, I, I mean, that dichotomy, we can get into that too. But what, what do you say to and of and about this 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 post liberal you you are, you know the contingent to whom I'm yeah we've referring. had Curtis Yarvin on on the on the show oh, I did I didn't know yeah um, I think he makes a lot of sense uh, and I think uh, you know a benevolent dictatorship is great the problem is how do you keep it benevolent <laughs> that's really the problem. And so the, the, the point of democracy isn't that it's a perfect system. The point of democracy is you can remove the people in power. That's the point. Uh, a ben look at Twitter, right? Twitter has become a benevolent dictatorship under Elon Musk. And it's a lot better, in my opinion, and improving rapidly because of it. Um, but you cannot run a society on that basis because the, the temptation is for the dictatorship to become malevolent pretty quickly power corrupts uh, and also even if they think no matter how vir how virtuous you start you think by design of authoritarian of not having democracy of not being able to be removed no matter how good you are you will eventually become no, bad not necessarily the, because of design no look you're going to get your Marcus Aureliuses and and your good kings every now and again but as a system of government um, it's I don't designed to not produce in the long term good outcomes. It doesn't allow for good outcomes because it doesn't allow you to replace the, the bad parts of the engine as they need to be replaced. Uh, and it puts people in a position of power who have a disincentive to, to being uh, benevolent on the one hand. On the other hand, I also, if you are intellectual honest, you have to recognize that the problem uh, critics of of the liberal worldview are identifying is not inaccurate. I mean, if you feel that the electoral system no longer produces outcomes that reflect the opinion of the majority of the public, uh, which is where we are, right? Are you telling me that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are representative of America? Are you telling me that the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in this country represent the values of British people by and large? They represent the consensus idea of the best way to move forward. We have people from the left in here and we ask them, are you excited about the idea of a Labour government? This is after what will be 14 years after a conservative left government, government in this country. None of them are excited about their own party coming in. You get a conservative in here and you say, are you excited about the government as it is the conservative government? None of them are excited about the conservative government either. So. The critique is based on some factual observations, which is where we've got to a position where the political system produces candidates that don't represent the values of the country mm. or the way of doing business that most people would want. And that's the problem. And that's why you're seeing people talk about, well, we should have a benevolent dictatorship. I don't agree with them that that is the system that we need because I don't think that works, because I don't think you're going to be able to have benevolent dictators over and over. You're going to have maybe one, and the next one is going to be malevolent. Um, but I think they're right that the, the system of government we currently have, uh, mainly as a product of mass media and then social media, produces these bland, unrepresentative people who have to pander to 
the 24 hour news cycle instead of actually doing courageous things and leading. Um, that's a problem. We shouldn't pretend it's not a problem. It I, is a problem. I, I agree that it's a problem, Constantine. Yeah. The, well, the question is, of course, what do we do about it? You know, could you have Churchill today with a 24 hour news cycle on Twitter? Right. Would a person like that, would it would, kind of a great Well, we don't know problem? because the, the, the way that the, the current system is, so I don't know what the case is in America, but in this country, um, you have to be, be a member of one of the two parties to make any sort of political impact, mm. right? And in yeah, of course, and, it's, yeah, we have two parties. So. And by the time you get to the top of a party, you've already had to swallow so much <laughs> that you might as well keep swallowing. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So we, gen we, we generally don't know what would happen if someone with principles and, uh, you know, the desire to stand up for those principles uh, attempted to pursue a leadership role. We just don't know. Sure we do. People run for president all the time and they they don't win because they're not a member of one of the two parties. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. I'm just saying. Yeah. If you want to win, you have to be part of one of the two. So uh, eventually we may get fed up with that system and, and come up with something that allows people to come through. I mean, but the, hold on, <laughs> we can't just skate past that. Come up with what? We have a constitution in the U.S. Yeah. anyway. We have a constitution. Yeah. We have a good, have a good system. You know, with that that has in recent years, perhaps because of you pointed to mass media would mm. be one thing. Twenty four hour news cycle another. Overhaul, I don't necessarily think is. The answer. I don't mm -hmm. think it's an effective answer. How do we, within the system that we have, create better outcomes? You can't. You so can't. you are in favor of a more revolutionary no, approach? No, not at all. Uh, the thing that we have to change, I talked about mass media and social media, mm -hmm. we have to change the media landscape right. for this to change. You have to create platforms. So media would be the culprit. Or one of one of the big ones. This isn't me saying, you know, the corporate media is blah blah blah. Those systems of communication yeah. encourage a particular way of doing politics and a particular way of doing business. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna get a conversation of this nature happening on a mainstream platform, which is amazing to me because these are highly clickable, profitable ways of communicating online. But the mainstream media isn't really doing that much. Yeah. But what you have to do, in my opinion, is to change the media landscape where uh, people are able to have conversations in a different way and people are talking about politics in a different way. Uh, and they're not trying to gotcha everybody all the time and they're trying to encourage people to show the best version of themselves. Uh, once you establish that there is a media ecosystem that encourages people to act in a different way and to show up in a different way as leaders, as politicians, etc., then there will be a body politic that votes for those people, that has uh, an appetite to see those people coming through. And you're starting to see this. I mean, uh, whatever you think of the candidates themselves is kind of irrelevant here, but whether it's RFK Jr. or Vivek or other people who are kind of products of new media, really, in many ways, right? Those, sure. Those the, whether you like those particular candidates is kind of irrelevant. My point is, we're going in a direction where increasingly, yeah. a diff Vivek is a former guest of Trigonometry, right? Yeah. He's He did the podcast. And the Quillette podcast. And the Quillette <laughs> podcast. He did all the rounds. Yeah. He sharpened his thinking. He got himself onto this very small part of the map as it is now. The bigger our section of the map becomes, the more I think you're gonna find that people are able to speak to a different audience and that audience follows them into the real world and is therefore voting for them and following what they do, et cetera. So I think uh, that's part of the solution and uh, it's about changing the media ecosystem, which is what I intend to do. Well, you're already doing it. And I intend to continue. There's this, uh, a quote comes to mind. Uh, it would be very, I think it was, I think it was on your podcast. It may, it may have been, excuse me if I'm wrong. Mm. And it was Eric Weinstein said, it's very hard to maintain one's anti-Semitism at a Shabbat dinner or living yes, through he said it living, nice. living yeah. through a Shabbat yeah. dinner. I think meeting with people from the other side, having mm. that discourse, having your opinion, you said Vivek made the round, sharpened his thinking, talking with people, sharpening your thinking, mm. being open to debate. Mm. And what's the form for that? It's not everyone should 
you know, be, not everyone can, or, you know, we'll, we'll be going around doing rounds of podcasts, but listening to things from different sides, mm. having consuming media that is much more personal and where you and I, we're, we're speaking like a couple of old pals. Mm. We're speaking face to face, human to human. We're not, you know, behind a teleprompter with 15 layers of, of, of makeup and rehearsed lines and, and shiny cameras and whatever, and a teleprompter that we're literally reading off of. Um, and you, more importantly, you didn't come in here to make me look bad. You, you came in here to find out who I am. And if that looks bad, fine. The marketplace of ideas will decide. We, we will decide that. Uh, but you didn't come in here to try and trip me up or make me look bad. Now, you may have questions about things I've done or said, and we can talk about that. But the agenda you have is not one to get clicks at my expense. And that is what a lot of the media point. is, Good right? Point. That's the difference. And the moment you start using politicians to get clicks, that's when the system starts to break down. Yep. Right? Now... I think we're actually at the very beginning of something very exciting. If you look at the biggest platform in the world is Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan will have you on for three hours and he will listen to what you have to say. And Joe is very fair. Like when we when we did his show, I said something that was, I think, accurate, but not perfectly phrased. He immediately picked me up on it and we corrected it. But he wasn't like, oh, you said that. Are you racist? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So yeah. I think that's really a lot of the solution is I know it's like if you said to me, well, we've got an obesity epidemic. What's the answer? The answer is for people to eat better and exercise. If we have, what a concept. If yeah. we have an intellectual obesity epidemic, which is what we've got because we're being fed crap, mm. the answer to that is to eat whole foods for our mind. Yeah. And that is... <laughs> it's such a good point. Open discussion. My Constantine, that's excellent. We do, that's, that's perfectly phrased. So I think, I think that's... Uh, look, that is only a small fragment of the solution. There's probably political stuff around, you know, the way we do elections. There's yeah. probably stuff about parties. There's, there's stuff about money and politics. There's all sorts of stuff. I can only tell you, you know, the more the more people listen to what I say, the less I try to speak about things I don't know about. Mm. I know about media just by virtue of doing this. I think most of the way the media has been going about things is wrong. And I think the success of many shows, including ours, is a product of the fact that we're doing things differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're making whole food for your mind. And we have, you know, in the last month, we've released two interviews with like super far left socialist people and Nigel Farage and, 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 right? You get a spectrum of opinion, but people are treated as human beings. We have a discussion and you make up your own mind. That's, I think, the future for improving uh, all of this stuff really is open communication, dialogue, meeting people, understanding where people are different, different people are coming from. We got to change what we put in our bodies and our minds. I, I keep track every week of my diet, not just my food diet, but my media diet. Mm. And I'm very conscientious about the clips I'm watching on YouTube shorts. If I'm using, I've, I've currently deleted Instagram from my phone. We'll, we'll see how long this this lasts. It's been, I don't know, a month or two of this. Mm. Um, but I keep track of the clips I'm watching. I keep track of the music I'm listening to. I keep track of the articles I'm reading because that stuff has, first of all, has a big effect on the way that you think and how you're looking at the world, at the, on the heuristics that you're using. Mm. And it, it subconsciously influences you. I mean, I remember, I like, the music you're listening to, too, you may not be conscious of it, but it's absolutely a reflection of your, not to get too Jungian, but like your, your subconscious and what's going on under there. Completely. I remember specifically listening to like breakup songs about a month, six weeks before I broke up with my now ex-girlfriend. Mm. And at the time, I was just like, ooh, these are so catchy. I like these <laughs> new songs. I like these songs. But I wasn't having the conversation, oh, these lyrics are speaking <laughs> about a breakup. I was yeah. just like, this rhymes and this is groovy. Um, so media diet is absolutely uh, absolutely something that influences the way that we think. And I, I, I write it down every week. I write, I, you know, I, like, I keep track of my, my food and media diet. Right. Um, That's smart. And I think you know, there are a lot of people who go, oh, social media is terrible. And I'm like, if your personal experience of social media is terrible, the chances are you're following the wrong people. My social media experience is fucking great. 
I love going on Twitter and talking to people, exchanging ideas, seeing what my audience wants to me to, to talk about or wants to say or wants to criticize what I've said or done or whatever. I love it. There are times when people pile on and whatever, and obviously no one enjoys that. But broadly speaking, my experience with social media is fucking great. So if you keep being shown things you don't want to see, stop following the people that oh, are showing it to you. It's, I didn't even know this mm. until not so long ago. Mm. Um, there's a little thing, at least on, on, on YouTube shorts, you can click, don't show me this. Yeah. Don't show me this. You yeah. do that two or three times, you're yeah. not going to see that shit again. Right. Um, and I would encourage everyone to do that. Like, be really careful. Think about what's draining energy, what's creating energy. You can. There's obviously overload here. I think people should also track how much time they're spending on the different platforms. Mm. Uh, iPhone allows you to do some of it. There's different things you can mm. do. Um, but yeah, be, be really conscious. And don't follow, like obviously you follow people you like disagree with. You should know about the different perspectives, but if someone inspires like rage in you, don't hate follow people. I mean, I, I, I would say like, don't, don't follow no, You can hate follow me. I appreciate the uh, engagement. <laughs> Uh, Look, man, this is one of the things that tends to happen, though, and uh, you have to recognize it, is the more your audience grows or the bigger profile you have, the more you, you get exposed to people who have different perspectives on what you do. Uh, and that's also a really important part of life. Now, you know, unfair criticism, bad faith engagement, all of that stuff sucks. However, there are people who follow me who really disagree with a lot of stuff that I say. Good, good. more power to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, and as long as they're getting what they want out of that. I'm happy for them. We have time for a few, yeah. a few more final yeah. ones here. I don't know what time it is, but I'm happy to. Play. I don't know what time it is either. I... Let's look it up. It's twenty part. Yeah, we're good. 20 part. See if if I adjust my sleeve too much, then it'll it'll mess up the the perfect the perfect cuff length that I have oh. going on, so I can't roll up to get the watch. I'm just joking. Um, okay. As far as the central problems facing our society today. When when historians look back on things, there's I'm I'm trained for formally anyway in history. Mm. Um, there's different frameworks uh, that we can use to understand why something has happened. Like ex post facto, we're looking back on something. How did we arrive at the at the point? Whether it's a revolution or it's some other break line or fall or turning point, whatever it is, you mm. know. Historians use different methods to to look at this. One is a more quantitative scientific approach, looking at population rates, looking at um, economic production related to, you know, weather can be involved, like acts of God. There's, you know, there's crop failure. There's there's an abundance of, of new crops, whatever. Mm. Um, so there, one could argue that, in fact, there's a lot of things going on in the West today. There, there's, you know, unstable population rates or an aging population. And so that's an issue. Young people aren't having sex with each other. That's an issue. And and, and then why is this the case? You know, boys are afraid to talk to girls because me too stuff, you know, whatever. Like there's lots of reasons for this. Mm -hmm. My my question is like whether it's population, whether it's uh some kind of change in the cultural zeitgeist, whether it's whatever it is, there's a lot of um, if we were to look back, say 20 years, 30 years, on how we arrived to the current set of conditions which we occupy, there's different explanations. Mm. And it's not that one is more right than the other. They all may be useful. But my question is simply to you this. Do you believe that wokeness is the central issue facing the West today? Sorry for the long-winded introduction is is difficult to say it's the central issue because people but what what you don't think uh i don't know uh war in ukraine or you don't think this or you don't think that no 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 i mean more like like population rates like like crop you know growth well, rates, look, like gdp so it's not gdp but you have to recognize that the economic model that we're operating on is completely morally and practically bankrupt right we keep printing money we don't have to buy things we can't afford. And the reason we keep doing that is we have an electoral system where politicians bribe you with your own money to get elected. Well, we also borrow pretty heavily. Well, that's what I mean. Why do we borrow heavily? Because no politician can say we are spending money we don't have. We are printing money we don't have to appease you so that you vote for me. 
But that is what's happening. And that is what's been happening since 2008 and before that, right? So 2008 was a moment when we uh, had a massive financial crisis. And that was the moment when we should have had a wake-up call about the fact that what we're doing is unsustainable. Instead, what we did is we dropped interest rates to unprecedented historic levels and kept them there for the entire time up until COVID, at which point we printed even more money to pay ourselves money that we can't afford. So we are borrowing from my grandchildren. We have a housing crisis. I don't know whether it's true where you are, but in this country, it's a massive problem for young people. it's a global issue. It's a global issue. So that means that that changes the way people pair up, get married, relate to each other, et cetera. Sure. If when people don't have children, particularly young people, it changes the way they behave. It mm. changes the culture. When you don't, having a child, I can tell you from experience, adjusts your mindset. And it puts you in a very different frame of mind when you look at the world, mm. the way you see things, the way you do things, of course. the politics you have, et cetera. So you have a financial and economic system that is disincentivizing people from reproducing. Mm. A lack of reproduction changes the way people think. And then you have the digital revolution uh, where the way information is communicated is completely different. And you see in terms of wokeness, all of these markers of wokeness, all of this stuff about institutional racism, uh, you know, patriarchy, all this stuff, that discourse takes off in the public consciousness when social media becomes mainstream. 2013, 2014, the evidence is all there on that. So you have a a, a flawed economic system combined with a digital revolution, uh, combined with what we talked about earlier, which is we're very, very successful. And we have been for quite some time. We've had an enormous, un- really long period of peace. Mm. You know, yes, there have been invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and we've had things. But generally speaking, there hasn't been a world war or a major war for a long time. Mm. Um so we have successive generations of people who've been unthreatened by anything, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, you put all these things together, you're going to get to where we are. So is wokeness the central issue? Mm, I don't know. There are a number of issues that are coming together. Uh, but the key point on the wokeness side of things is a society that is unwilling to stand up for itself and assert its own values will not survive. So. In that sense, yes, wokeness is a central issue because what wokeness teaches us is to view ourselves as uh, evil, racist, you know, the, the, the most terrible people in history and to self-flagellate endlessly. That that will lead eventually to a complete lack of confidence in ourselves and, and there's only one, one way that can go historically. In some ways, it's both the symptom and the root cause. Yeah, exactly. It's and a self-perpetuating. It's a, and it's self-perpetuating. It's the, uh, the Ouroboros. It's this image of a snake eating itself, mm-hmm. uh, consumed by desire. Well, and if you think about the core of workness is teaching people to be victims, when you teach people to be victims, you are disempowering them, and as a result, they become victims. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, and then you go. Look, I told you you were a victim. Look how much of a victim you are, and and on and round and round it goes. Wow, they're stocking their quaffers. You know, they're it, it's it's and it's a profitable industry. Yeah, it's an incredibly profitable industry. Yeah. And that I mean that that if if not for any ideological reasons, that alone should I think convert people to know that there are a small number of people who are getting fabulously wealthy off of the fact that you're too stupid to see that you're being spoon-fed this nonsense and that it's coming from on high from people who don't give any particular kind of shit about the issues which you day in and day out claim to be the central you know, fight of your existence. And there's a very simple litmus test that I like to apply to people. If you look at people who are telling you something are they a happy person? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's, it's look, good look litmus test. <laughs> because when I look at Joe Rogan, I think that's a really happy guy, right? Yeah. Now, right? He's enjoying life. He's happy mm-hmm. to be doing. He's infinitely curious. He's really respectful. He's a really lovely guy. Is that a happy person? Yes. When I look at many of these activists, 
Are they happy people? Are they fulfilled? <laughs> Do they have meaning in their lives? Do they have purpose? This is well said, my friend. This is well said. So I want to be like the happy people because I want to be happy. Are you happy? I'm del- I'm, my life is fucking great. My, and, and people massively overestimate how much money I make and, and all sorts of things. I have a great life. I, I, I run a business and a YouTube show with my friends. Uh, we have a great team of people who love being here. To them, it's a privilege to be here. And for us, it's a privilege to have really hardworking, driven people being here. Uh, my wife's amazing. My son's amazing. Um, I get to have fascinating conversations with people that I admire on a daily basis. Uh, I get to make the impact in the world that I think needs to be made. I have thousands of people around the world who wish me well. Uh, I get to appear on really cool TV shows and make comedic stuff and satirical stuff and serious stuff and do all that. Uh, What's not to love? I have a great life. I've never been more fulfilled Mm. uh, than I am today. Uh, So, yeah. Flourishing. uh, yeah, I'm enjoying life a lot and, and I'm very, very happy. And the feeling that I'm overwhelmed with all the time is just gratitude. And it's very easy for me and Francis to be grateful because we started what we do in a room above a comedy club with nothing. We had no cameras, no microphones, no name, no social media platforms where people followed us in any significant numbers. We had nothing. And we started it, we took a stand on what on principles that were important to us and we've been rewarded for that with with it with a job that we love and an opportunity to create things that we believe in Uh, it's really easy to be grateful if if you're us but the more grateful i am the more i realize that even when it's not easy to be grateful it's still important to be grateful because the gratitude is is what makes you uh, a better person and makes you happier too so yeah very happy it's something that can be practiced and cultivated gratitude it's a mu- you know it's a muscle you have to you can discipline yourself to be grateful mm. it's the same thing with going to the gym you know you see all the the hardo guy i i subscribe to this whether it's goggins or, or <laughs> i love goggins um or, or jocko willink whoever saying like it's not about motivation you know it's you don't have to be motivated you get up you go to the gym same with gratitude do five minutes of gratitude journaling you know write down i don't know one two three things there's there's plenty of stuff on the internet mm. people can find but um practicing gratitude making it a habit enriches your life and enriches the life of everyone around you uh to an extraordinary degree and by virtue i think it makes the world of just a slightly better place you know it's just like uh, i was listening to this uh pete holmes uh michael Schur podcast the other day um it's like, just make the world like a little bit of a better, like 0.0001%, you know, mm. a percent better play you know, mm. the number of, uh, the number of uh, hate crimes that actually happen. <laughs> um, I'm joking. Uh, like just like the, it's the, you know, one one hundred thousandth of a percentage or whatever, you know, but that matters and that adds up. And then the world is a little bit better mm. and you're a little bit happier or you're a lot happier and the people around you are a lot happier and you're more enjoyable to be around. Gratitude, absolutely would recommend. <laughs> so, And we have a lot to be grateful for. We do. All of us. So we do. That, that's really, I think, a message that's helpful for all the stuff that we're talking about. Because if you think about, you know, if most people in society were happy about what they have and grateful for it, would we be having these conversations? Would we be fighting over stuff all the time? You know, and look, of course, not everyone is in a good place, but I think a lot of the way you feel about life is down to your attitude yeah, and and the direction you feel you're traveling in. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of that, you know, people want to outsource responsibility for their life to other people or to the government or whatever. No, (laughs) bad idea. 95% of your life has nothing to do with, if you live in the West, yeah. This is the difference, and this is why the West is valuable, because if you live in, in Russia or if you live in China, a lot of your life is controlled by the government, Yeah. right? Or your local government. You know, you have to reckon with that in a way that we really don't. Most of your life is down to you. Uh, That's right. And if you change the attitude or you adjust the attitude that you have, you can change how happy you are. Um, and you will create more things in the world that are of value to other people, and that will change how happy you are. So, 
yeah, in my opinion, if you look at somebody and you go, this person's deeply miserable, that's probably not a great person to emulate. That's not a great person whose life philosophy for you should be listening to. So if there's someone who's going around angrily telling you that you're a victim because of the color of your skin, there's probably other people with the same skin color that are telling you you have the biggest opportunity in the history of the people with your skin color ever, and maybe you might want to listen to them. You yeah. Know? And then and then try both of those approaches on and work out which one of them is real because or, or which one produces the outcomes that you want. Exactly. And that's the thing I think people often forget is the worst thing you can tell people who are victims is that they're victims. Right, a hundred percent. It's cruel. It, what you ought to be telling them is, look, I recognize you have a difficult lot in life. And there are yeah. people who have way easier lives than I've had. And there are people who've had way worse than lives, lives than I've had. Mm -hmm. And within those two groups, there are people who've done way better than me and people who've done way worse than me in both of those groups. There are people who had everything on a plate. And because of that, they're sad and miserable and take drugs every day. And I'm just really fundamentally unhappy and broken and sad and lost and depressed. And there are people who, who were born with no arms and legs, who are way more successful, who've weighed more money, yep. Who, yep. Who, who are happier than I am. And that's, and that's all you need to know about life, right? That's the choice before you. And you pick your way. Do you, and, and being a victim is fucking great, by the way. People love it. People it's feel, not great. It is great. Oh, it's great. That's why people want to be victims because it feels so good because nothing's your responsibility. Nothing's your fault. I don't think... I understand the point you're making. Of yeah. I understand people love point. being victims because there's something in it. There is something in it, ultimately, as we will agree. You know, it's counterproductive, though. It, it does not. But it's the happiness. same with fentanyl. It feels great for a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I imagine. I don't know. I, I, right? I don't know. So either. you alleviate the pain that you have deep inside by taking something that gives you a short term burst of pleasure. And that's what victimhood is it gives you a sense that nothing's your fault. You are, you know, you are, you are where you are because of the circumstances of your life. And in the immediate moment, that feels good, but it's not, it's not making you good overall. It's not making you healthy overall. It's not giving you what you want overall. There's uh, your fellow countryman with the jawline, uh, Will, uh, Chris Williamson. Mm. Um, he had uh, Alex Homozy on, uh, I don't know, recently. Yeah. yeah, I listened to it on my way up to Oxford. Um, and then, <laughs> this is hilarious. I was walking around uh, Maudlin College in Oxford listening to this very silly but awesome uh, techno remix of David Goggins saying, who's going to carry the boats? And it was just like the dichotomy. It was beautiful pasture, yeah. animals, and then Goggins yelling, who's going to carry the boats in the background? Anyway, I'm listening to this uh, Williamson or Mosey interview. And it was like, uh, I, think, I think it was Chris quoting uh, Hormozy back to him, but he's like... Um, there's somebody who had less and did more, you know, or somebody who had less and, and did better. There's always going to be somebody who had it worse and did it better. Mm -hmm. So it's like you are where you are. You have the advantages or disadvantages that you have. Where, where are you going to go from there? And you only have one life, man. This is what, you know, I, I, I'm present to that in the way that I probably wasn't at your age. Well, definitely wasn't at your age because I was so busy trying to survive and whatever. But you only have one life. So... You can sit there and be a victim if you want. You can sit there and feel that you've been taken advantage of and oppressed and whatever. What? But, yeah, see where it gets you. Where like, is that going to get you? It's not going to get you anywhere. And the fact is your life will end much sooner than you probably think about. And when that happens, nothing happens. I nothing, think, nothing happens. Yeah. Right? Look, you can have your religious belief about the afterlife and that's great. But in this life, nothing happens when you die. Your closest relatives will miss you, and that's it. And that's it. All the people who are, quote, unquote, your haters, they're going to forget about you. And all the people who are, who are big fans of yours will, will be sad that you're gone. But ultimately, nothing happens. So you might as well make the most of it. You might as well go for it. You might as well do what you believe. You might as well say what you think. You might as well be the kid at the back of the class and say, you know what, I don't believe this. Mm. I've only got one life, so you've got to be true to yourself. And being a victim isn't being true to yourself or anybody, even the most victimized people ever. It still doesn't help them. It still doesn't make their life better. And we've had people who've been through way more than I have. We've had people who've been gang raped sitting in that chair saying exactly the same thing. You have to overcome. You have to make it through. You have to be strong. You have to blah, blah, blah. And that's 
There's no getting away from that. And by the way, this is a message that is thousands of years old. We're not inventing the wheel here. No, we're not. Human beings not. have known this for thousands of years. You want to vol uh, wallow in victimhood, go, go for it. And I agree with you, you're a victim. You are, because everyone is in some way. Is that going to help you be a better person and live your life in a happier way? Well, look around. I think there's two camps here. There's one camp of people who, and it's a, it, this is a small minority. This, like this is a, a, a very small number of, of, of the victim mongers and the, the global victim community, the victimhood <laughs> professing community, uh, who genuinely believe that they are, you know, words like justice get thrown around, words like fairness, equality get thrown down there get thrown around and I think there's a, a very small number of people who have thought really hard about these issues and who say this is unfair this is unjust I am oppressed and people who look like me are oppressed and given the values for which uh, the country I live in claims to stand this is wrong and I am going to dedicate my life to the political project of attempting to ameliorate the very negative circumstances uh, that are unjustly and immorally being imposed on me and people who look like me. Um, and that is a wonderful cause. That, that, that is a wonderful cause. I totally agree. There have been some very abhorrent uh, leaders who needed to be removed. There has been very abhorrent policies that needed to be uh, rolled back or, or, or eliminated altogether. Mm -hmm. um, that's a noble cause, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that that is a tiny minority of the global victimhood community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that I think that if if that's you, more power to you. I'm glad that you thought about this, and I'm glad that you're fighting for a worthwhile cause. Mo but to tell a teenage boy, to tell a teenage black kid in Chicago or or, or New York or wherever he is, Baltimore wherever he is, that no matter how hard you try, no matter how successful you are in school and whatever, no matter how much you apply yourself, you will never succeed because the system is stacked against you. So it's not even worth giving it a shot because despite your best efforts, the white man, America, the system, the man, whatever it is, is always going to cut your legs out from under you. So. Don't even, don't even play at that game. Don't even attempt to do your best. Just give it all up. You know, this is not a fight worth engaging in. That's cruel. That's not fair to this kid. That is not something that somebody who's genuinely interested in the human flourishing of this kid would tell them. So I think there's a distinction to be made between these, between these two camps. Agreed. Yeah. Last, 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 last few questions here. Do you have a perspective on the current creator economy? I mean, you're a part of it. Mm -hmm. And now with the advent of AI, we can do all kinds of cool stuff with AI. You can, you can clip your podcast, you know, not <laughs> super well yet. You can create generative uh, images and, and, and music and, and you can have AI write your poet mm. or whatever you want. Mm. Um, so AI is a part of this question. It's a part of the environment. The creator economy, the fact that you don't need to have a nine to five anymore. You can have a little, you know, do like freelance work for multiple people, have recurring clients. You make a lot, you can make money on the internet basically, mm -hmm. um, or money as a, as a, as a solopreneur. That's, that's what I am. I'm a solopreneur. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's part of it too. Mm -hmm. AI is part of the question, making the democratization of, of access to different kinds of work and you connect it with the whole world it's another part of the equation uh twitter you know is is, is and twitter under uh under elon is another mm -hmm. part of the equation but what's your perspective do you have a perspective and what is your perspective on the current creator or gig economy whatever you want to call it i think that in my space consolidation is coming uh, I think this idea that you're going to give $5 a month to your top favorite 50 podcasts is not going to is not going to happen. The admin alone is a pain in the ass, right? So I think what will <laughs> yeah. increasingly happen is uh, people will operate under an umbrella 
Uh, and so what you're likely to see is the formation of the kind of media empires of the future over the next 10 years where uh, people who have an existing platform yeah. will start yeah. to bring other content creators under the umbrella. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, you mentioned Ben Shapiro, obviously the Daily Wire is a good example of this. Great example. Um, and we, we have some plans in the work along those lines. So that's what I see coming. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, Vice tried to do it. And Vice did a good job for a while. They aired and made some bad uh, ideological and also financial decisions. But not to get into all of that, the simple idea of having a platform online of different brands, that was kind of cool for a while they didn't yeah. implement it yeah properly yeah but having but, a one-stop shop for you know for yeah, some documentary films some podcasts some some news exactly uh, ben did it very well they've done it very well i i, I really respect ben and, and his his guys uh we politically don't have we're not in the same political you know segment uh which is good because no, I'm, I'm not either but you know but but in terms of the model of what yeah. they've done absolutely brilliant um and yeah, I think there's there's going to be people coming together and moving forward together as part of the same umbrella uh, going forward. I see that coming, definitely. Well, that's a rosy way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it would be that when the consolidation happens and let's let you play this out, the consolidation happens, you know, you have, even if it's atomized, you have a group of podcasts operating under this company and another group of podcasts and 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 and. and independent films or whatever mm. operating under this one and this one. Mm -hmm. um, say there's 10, say there's 20, say there's 50, you know, whatever, it, maybe not 50, but say there's a small number of them, of, of really big players, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a free market and there's other consolidations that will happen and mm. there's other new players. But how do we avoid this? I mean, this happens to the music industry. You, there's lots of artists. Everyone wants to sign with the label. The label's by you know a lot of artists complain about the labels being exploitative um, or the industry itself being exploitative um how do we we've seen this model work in film we've seen it work in music mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen the issues that come along mm -hmm. therein so how do we still encourage free market like that some kid in his garage in portland wherever he is can have his podcast and then maybe get signed by by Constantine's label. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think know. we need to encourage anything. I think the technology is there to allow people to do that. To, to free market, flourish. Make your stuff. Yeah. This is the beauty of the internet. There's no gatekeepers. There's no gatekeepers. You don't need to sign with Constantine's label or anyone else's label if you don't want to. It's, mm. it's, it's about mutual benefit. If you start something in your garage and it becomes the biggest show in the world, Great, good. You don't, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. can, and people have done it. And on YouTube, on other parts of the internet, you can do that. If you make good content, it's what we've done. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Go for it. If you want to be part of an umbrella organization that's give you is going to give you more opportunity, that will be there for you too. Mm. If you don't want to be, I don't think Joe Rogan is ever going to start a label. I just don't think that's how he thinks. I don't think he's ever going to sign to someone else's label either. He's just going to do his podcast as yeah. long as he enjoys doing it. Yeah. Um, go for it. I, I think the more people start stuff and do stuff and create interesting things, the better. And then we'll see. We'll see. And look, your point is correct. The media empires of the future will become media organizations. And when something becomes an organization, there's a risk of losing the very core values that were there at the beginning of it. <laughs> and it's the it's the eternal dance and the eternal merry-go-round in which we go. That's just how it's going to be. You, you, get, <laughs> you get fragmentation and then you get consolidation. Fragmentation, consolidation. I, I think I think that's we are in we were for the last many years in massive fragmentation. I think the next few years you're gonna see a lot of consolidation happening. Yeah, I had uh, had Zuby on. Mm. Uh, uh, whenever I had him on, and time is time is weird. Um, and I think it was like a year ago. Uh, and he said he'd never signed with the label. He just releases all his own mm -hmm. music under his own. He has his own label. Like he just does yeah. his thing. Um, and he's been very successful with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, he has. Um, and that that can be done too. That can be done too. On the subject. This is, we're, we're, we're coming up at the end here, I promise. Um, at least it stops raining now too, so I can, I can walk, back to, uh, walk back home peacefully. Um, 
there seems to be a kind of nefarious cultural mercantilism happening with like cultural mercantilism as is an idea is that what's America's main export it's not you know potatoes or crops tobacco whatever it's culture mm -hmm. everything's downstream from mm -hmm. America mm -hmm. the crazy shit the good shit the bad shit everything downstream yeah for better or for worse it has become kind of I don't know if nefarious is the right word, but like we're we're producing some bad like bad cult. I mean, it's always been the case, but like bad art, bad cinema. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a the CEO of Netflix got up and someone was like, uh, he said, "I don't care that to, that I make good movies. I care that people watch them." Uh, there's a lot of just very poorly done films on Netflix, but people sit around every night they, they watch them. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's bad, like not of good quality content or ideas that are being disseminated from America. And then there's also the dangerous stuff, the, mm -hmm. the woke stuff, mm -hmm. gender, race, whatever, that's coming out of America and infecting the minds of, you know, the global youth, you know, via in social media it makes it even faster now. It used to take weeks to show up in newspapers, some journalists come up with it. Now it's like, boom, start a trend in LA, start a trend in wherever, mm -hmm. goes down. Um, so there's this cultural mercantilism that's happening. In line with the idea of cultural mercantilism, I specifically want to ask about film. What the hell is going on in Hollywood? Why have we stopped making good movies? And part of the answer may be because it's profitable to make bad movies. But also just- I don't know that it is. Uh, I, I think there's a, it's a, a lot of it is ideological. Uh, there's a certain worldview that they have. Uh, Who's they? The people who make movies. Uh, and it's not just them, it's the soup in which they swim. It's the, the, the water in which they swim. There is a, I mean, this, uh, there was this big furore with, um, I don't remember her name, the, the girl who plays Snow White. Yeah, I don't know. And she said, she basically talked about how Snow White is no longer about her <laughs> finding love. Snow Black. <laughs> well, it's not about race, it's about the fact that she's no, it's no longer about her finding the prince and falling in love and all of that. Uh, it's it's about her becoming confident and independent and powerful and whatever, and so <laughs> no, just write a story about that. Then that's not what Snow White's about. <laughs> well, right, but but my point more broadly is that they have a certain a certain set of ideas that they are attempting to communicate through the medium of cinema, mm. and those ideas don't map on very well onto what ordinary people want to see a movie about. Because ordinary people, believe it or not, actually do want to fall in love and they want to see a story about falling in love yeah. because it's the basis of human society and civilization. But these people have an ideology, and so they're pushing it through uh, through the, the movies that they're creating. And then they get upset when no one watches them and say it's because people are sexist or whatever. Um, but on that, I think the market will win eventually. Uh, whether it's in Hollywood or elsewhere, somebody's going to start making good quality stuff, uh, and people are going to start watching it. Oppenheimer was fucking brilliant. I agree. I loved right. it. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm keen to see the new Napoleon film. I, I've seen a couple of the trailers. I think it could be interesting. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so we'll see. I mean, they can, or they can keep pushing their ideological crap on us and we won't watch and we'll watch other stuff. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, people. People, my wife, I always say about my wife, she's completely apolitical and as a result, extremely based. You know, and I think a lot of people are like that, actually. They don't pay attention to this stuff. They just think a lot of what's happening is super fucking weird and they're not interested. <laughs> My wife and I, we went to see Barbie because she wanted to see it just out of curiosity. She, she didn't enjoy it. She didn't, she's not going to go and see Barbie too. <laughs> right? So they created a lot of hype. They got people to watch it. And now people have realized they're making crap. Well, there you go. Well, it did make close to a billion dollars. Yeah. Well, I'd be very interested to see how many billions of dollars Barbie 2 makes, because they will release one, because that's mostly what they do now, is make sequels of successful things. Uh, I don't think it's going to make a bill. I'm not going to go and see Barbie 2. Neither is my wife. So um, the market will win on that issue in the end. People will watch stuff that they think is good, and they won't watch stuff that they don't think is good. I think on all issues, on anything, eventually the market uh will win the market will tell the story and that's why guys like you and i support the marketplace of ideas 
You need to let bad ideas out there so that the market can correct them. Constantine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.